Hi guys, welcome to my shop. I'm Robin. Uh, inspired by Tom Lipton's uh, Baby Bullet uh, Vice build uh, and seeing the um, advantages of uh, solid uh, copper vice jaws on the bench vice, uh, I decided it was time to uh, make a set for my, my old vice here and I uh, decided to use aluminum instead of copper. Um, not that there's a big deal between those. And also, I'm going to be talking and calling the screw I use a differential screw. Some might argue that um, these insert screws with the right and left hand thread that are used for various clamping things on inserts um, isn't a, a technically a differential screw where you have uh, two threads of different leads. But in the grand sense of uh, a screw with two different threads on it um, used for a purpose of uh, clamping or moving an item, um, that's the flavor that I'm, I'm using for it called differential. MSC catalog actually calls them differential screw. Other catalogs call them um, insert screws, clamping screws, whatever. So I just want to clarify that before we get into the um, video where I'll be calling them a differential screw. Finally getting around to making some aluminum jaws. Uh, some people would use copper. I'm just choosing to use aluminum here for cheaper. Uh, the one thing I hate about jaws is that when they put these mounting holes right where you're doing most of your clamping and uh, having the huge counter bore just don't like it so I'm going to make jaws using some uh, differential screws or I call them dog bone insert screws the ones that have left and right hand threads on each end and we're gonna make a set of jaws to go in here so that we don't have uh, hardly any of the jaw surface uh, affected by the mounting hole so here's the differential screw uh, that I'm using, 1032 right hand, 1032 left hand. I've used these for other things. Uh, I'll show you an example using a, where I made a sign bar for a project. Uh, so we end up needing to uh, have 1032 holes in the vice jaw. Uh, and then there's going to be a blind 1032 hole in the back of the uh, aluminum or copper jaw and the only hole that needs to be exposed is a hole big enough for the cross the corners of the allen wrench that goes in here so we're just going to have a little maybe ninety thousandths uh, hundred thousandths diameter hole in the face of the jaw so initially I was thinking oh, okay we already have holes here so I'm going to need to drill and tap uh, the 1032 holes in this in a new location and since I'm making the jaws it doesn't matter where they were and I thought wait a minute just make an insert to go in this hole, these are 5 16 18, I believe, screws. I'm just going to go on the lathe and I'm going to make a, a insert to thread into these. And then I don't have to do any machining on the vice jaws at all, and I'll still get what I'm after. And I can do my choosing to do my left hand threads in this because I don't have a left hand bottoming tap. So I'll be able to tap um, through the insert with the left hand. And then in the jaws where I need the blind tap, where I have 1032 um, right hand bottoming uh, taps, I can do it in that sense. So uh, we'll carry on from there. So a collet for holding the 5 16 all thread that we're going to make our uh, internally threaded left hand, 1032 left hand uh, thread bushings. So I've got a uh, collet stop in here, and I've got about uh, 3 eighths of an inch of engagement. And we're putting this in, and we're going to uh, part these off. I need four of them. So I'm setting my collet pressure here. Get where my collet's happy. I'm going to go belt sand the end of this uh, all thread off square so that I can have a good starting point. I'll be back. Since we have the collet closed now at the correct setting I can put my scale in here sit on the stop and set my length come up here I want roughly uh, half an inch this is about the length depth of cut there so I'm gonna set that lock my carriage now I'm gonna put my piece in that belt sand at the end open the collet get in against the stop now this piece is about 24 inches long and I'm um, going to actually uh, run pulling on I'm actually just holding this end out here so it doesn't whip 
going to start in low range here, get my setting, uh, about 1,000 RPM, maybe run to part these off. So I'm just letting this, guiding this with my hand as I part these off. And one of the important parts here is that my collet stop has a hole in it to accept the tip that is left on the end of the part. So now I can go in, press, part my next one off. This is a dangerous operation. I'm not suggesting that anyone would put a piece of material hanging out in a lathe like this, turning it on and holding it with their hands. But we do it all the time. Okay. Making four of these. Make sure you get your web. It's important to get your web off of there. That flap can go in there and hit the stop and give you a, give you a bad day. This is a way to part off lengths. It's backwards of the way you would normally think, but works extremely effectively. And just for good measure, since I'm going to do one piece for a uh, blunder in case something crazy happens. A whole lot easier to do one extra now. Okay. Now from that point, I can just switch to a chair control. Okay. I can come in here and set my what I'm going to do for a chamfer on the thread, just picking an arbitrary value there, making sure that looks good, seeing what whether it's chamfered enough, a little bit more, and I'm just going to set my digital zero to tool out in that location. And then go delta mode to that. So now I can just pop these in and out and do the ends. And we'll just flip it. Flip the part. Run into my zero on Z. Chamfer. Next piece. Go through them all like that. I'll do these and I'll come back. And now I have a, a spotting drill in the chuck. I've come in and set it so that I have a 3 a little over 3 16 diameter to chamfer the threads. And I'm going to actually hit these on both ends now. Just flip, take it out. Come in here. Go to my zero. Another wrench repeat. On these. And you'll notice, oh, you'll notice on the, um, I didn't even worry about taking the tit off from the parting because that comes off in this operation. This part of the drilling, so save a step of facing these to length or whatever. Length on these isn't critical, so there's no point in getting all wacky with a turning tool to face these off to length. Okay, now we're going to take the stop out because the next two operations are through operations where we're going to drill and uh, tap. And there's no need for a real end stop, so I'm just popping this off with a collet, uh, you know, collet wrench and getting rid of my stop. There's the stop. You see that stop had the hole for the tit from the part to go into. Call it back in. Set my tension again. Now these I'm just sticking in by hand. I'm going to drill through with my number 21 drill for my 1032 left hand. Change my drill here from spot to my step 21. Screw machine. Close this down and just blast through these. We're already chamfered both ends now, so everybody's happy. Yeah, better get back on center here. 
kind of just going through. Done. Repeat on the rest. Oh, forgot my stop button there. Good time for the air hose. Or my magnet. Yeah, it's coming down. I'll turn it on slow and blow it down there. Because it migrates to the end. Are we making any headway? Yes, we are. There it is. Okay. I just need to remember there's no stop. So running in uh, low end on the on the parting here. Now I got to remember I have to be in reverse because I'm in left hand thread. I gotta start in reverse and go the other way. So, get our tapping juice on. Come in here, I got my hand on the reverse switch. Being extra nice to the tap, reverse, high range to get out. Delightful. That's threaded left hand. Another one in. Get our juice. This is uh, Cool Tool 2 with uh, tight, uh, excuse me, tetrahedral boron nitride, basically white graphite. Make sure I'm in reverse. Works real well. I was using um, lebdum disulfide in it, but. I found the uh, tetrahedral works just as nice. Reverse. That's it. I'll do the rest. From an engineering perspective, I chose to do the uh, left-hand thread in the insert because I don't have a bottoming left-hand bottoming tap, and I need to bottom tap the aluminum jaws. Uh, the only negative to that is that. Um, you turn the screw counterclockwise to install and clockwise to uh, remove. So you just have to remember that when I go to remove the jaws that um, things are backwards. Here's the insert. Ready to go. You can see the, the uh, finished. You can see the chamfering everything first hand with a stop, internal, external, before drilling, and threading. Uh, just made things go very quickly. Now I just need to put a uh, screwdriver slot in these so that we can drive them in and out. So I'm going to grab these in the same collet. Uh, put the collet stop back in in my uh, Harding indexer. Uh, if any of you guys have these or are equivalent of it, one thing that's really handy is to surface grind flats on here that are in line with the key and perpendicular to the base, so you can just grab it in the vise. And then another addition I made is I basically have permanently mounted on this plate, which allows me to go over and grab that base, as you see it there, in the CNC vertically for vertical work. Uh, and well, I can grab it in this vise too, but it's pretty tall. I'd need a riser block on the bridge port to be able to do much with it in this case. But over in the CNC, I stick this on there in the, in the vise and just quickly get this thing lined up. So I'm just going to drop this in the vise and uh, get lined up. With so I'm going to get on uh, center here. I'm going to touch the top, lock my quill, my knees on zero, come out of the way. I'm going to go uh, the diameter of that thread over the screw is uh, about 309, so I'm going to go 154. And then I'm going to go half my 047 cutter, which is uh, 023 and a half. And I actually did dial math there where I re zeroed after the 150 and went again. So now we're going to um, put this in against the stop. And we'll set our depth. Okay, we're going to go about uh, yeah, 
50 deep. Okay, get a little juice. This doesn't need much, but here we go. One. Three, and so on. Running through the uh, insert again from the back to clean out the uh, just a little bit where the um, putting saw ran through. So we just double check with this to make sure that that left hand starts in there and doesn't fight. Because if it binds, it's just going to drive the other this screw down into the uh, hole further, and we don't want that to happen. These are about a sixteenth of an inch away from bottoming, so when they're flush, you got about a sixteenth more to go into the uh, vice body, but uh, which shouldn't cause a problem either. The width of the slitting call saw was not just something uh, willy nilly. I uh, actually measured this uh, stubby Craftsman screwdriver and uh, saw that 046 roughly was, was going to work well and I have a, a slitting saw at that size so pick that to have a decent fit. There is the insert threaded in there just about bottoming actually the one on the right here I actually had to go uh, grind a little bit of a shallower angle on it to get it to seat in it wasn't tapped quite as far as the other ones um, and then obviously on the other side we have our inserts there. This is a roll in EF1459 uh, saw uh, very very handy saw. The back fence that you see there with the um, plates is uh, ones I've made myself. It is built, drilled and tapped on the back for that. Uh, and then there's the uh, that clamping bar with the large plate um, that you see. Um, that actually has it stop. It hits the guard on the upper um, guide so it stops when it's done cutting through the material. So uh, just a very handy piece. <laughs> a uh, method of squaring up a bunch of pieces when things aren't super critical. Uh, one, two, three blocks, I just have a couple parallels stacked here in the bottom to, for a low height. Get the jaw, to get the vice jaws in the ballpark here, just, just gently touching, press down. Got my C-clamp, vice grip C-clamp ready to rip. Pressing down on the blocks, making sure they're square and snug. Same time, and grab this, and we tip right to it. Let's dust this off to clean up. Blocks are still grabbing there, which is very important. Some of these pieces probably are not even gripped by the vise because of the variation in the extrusion. That's why these are critical for... for <laughs> Five inches long. 
I'm just going to measure with my calipers down to my parallel. 1.477. Grab a calculator. 1.477. Enter. And then uh, get over here where I can measure down to here. Like I said, this isn't critical, but 3.5555. Plus 5.032 and a half. So we got 32 and a half to go. I'm going to take 30. I need a little bit for my back, back uh, swipe at the inside. If the parts are smaller than the inside of the tire, parts are smaller than the inside of the cutter, the inside lip of the insert is way sharper than the outside is doing all the work. It makes it a nicer finish the back straight. Obviously that only works when the length of cut is smaller than the ID of your cutter. So just as a double check, we'll do the measurement again before we loosen it up. Down to the parallels is One point four seven eight five, and this is now what? Three point five twenty six, five point oh oh four five. So this is my uh, homebrew chamfer machine. We call it the Chamfer Meister. It's made out of a uh, old Craftsman belt sander that had a nice design where it sits flat on the on the top, and it's been modified with. Um, the platens for uh, doing the uh, holding the part at the 45 degree angle. It has a travel here where you can slide and use various parts of the belt. And then it has an actual adjustment here that's calibrated uh, to set the actual chamfer size. So I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail here. Uh, if you guys have any, any interest in it, I can do a separate video on it. But it works really nice when you're doing a lot of chamfering. It's things noisy as all get out. Uh, I'm going to just fire it up and I'm going to initially be setting this chamfer size I want just visually and then I'm going to do a couple edges. Plug it in. Plugging it in helps immensely. It definitely works faster. Chamfer size that I'm after. This is a light break. I don't want to keep chamfer too far. A little bit more. Okay, so now I just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So put an end stop on. Throw some parallels in with just a couple rubber bands to hold them in place. Tighten my stop. And help that right out, right? Eyes. Share my digital between my lathe and the mill. So, when I have stuff like this, I just go old school and use the dials. So, I'm drilling these about uh, 11 30 seconds deep because we want these blind. And I'm going to just be changing the pieces in and out. Uh, and the same setting as I go through these.
small drill in. The drill is just about 10 thousandths bigger than the uh, cross corners of the 332nd wrench. So drill all these same way. Okay. drill press dedicated to the tapping head uh, so I'm going to tap these small v-groove in, in uh, one of these and the, I guess the, probably the rear jaw, the jaw that's on the moving jaw and uh, so I'm just setting this at 45 degrees, nothing critical here. Uh, the purpose of that is to um, like a grab screws a lot to saw off a little bit of a with a hacksaw, saw off a screw so there's nothing precision about this. So this is a quick and dirty setup for just doing the 45 here and Put a little LPS3 on the mating surface there. That stuff's really good for long-term anti-corrosion. And I'm putting some uh, blue molly on the actual screws. So I'm gonna move one of these up here. So we don't end up with stuff seasoning the uh, threads of the aluminum or the or the insert. So we're going to get one started here. So this will be this way, just enough that it doesn't fall off. Get this just enough that it doesn't fall off. There we go. This is going to be on this side. So, like I said, we've got to back up to thread these in opposite the normal direction. A couple turns. And I think I'm going to get the second wrench so I can turn two at once. There we go. I can turn them to get up oh, the wrong way. I can just thread these in. There she be. So I'm going to make sure I'm seated well, give a good snug. Back side, make sure I got the right end in. I got the right hand on the right hand on the tip. Get that started in the uh, piece. Just enough to get started. Same thing, make sure I got the right hand pointing out. Just enough to get it engaged, line it up, and 
Why does that give me a hard time? Oh, there we go. Back that one up. Back that up. Okay, get those outer wrenches in. doesn't like when it gets out of parallel. Okay, now yeah, line the jaw up, give this a snug. Tap these down. Okay. Allen wrench back. A hard block here to. There we have it. Hardened jaws with almost no interference. Not hardened jaws, aluminum jaws. Lovely. Here's the sign bar I mentioned. Uh, this was for a uh, project I had for a customer where there was a grind workhead that they wanted a means of setting the uh, angular grind on the uh, live workhead um, to an exact value. So I needed to make a sign bar and I needed to have the um, rollers hollow so I could use spring-loaded uh, pins that held these tight against the gauge block stack because it's going to work in a horizontal position. And I'll show some still pictures of how this was, was used. But anyhow, since I was making one, uh, I figured I'd make two of them and keep one for myself. Uh, the key here is that um, I decided to use the differential screw just like we used in the jaws um, and I just chose the 1032 version here. I have the um, right hand thread in the bar, left hand thread in the, uh, in the actual uh, roller or the, the pin and then as you can see here you can get the Allen wrench right in here. And there's just enough room to do one full, a little uh, more than one full flats worth of uh, engagement. And then the radius here in the bar itself is just a little bit bigger than the roller. Gives a lot of structural integrity to the to the bar. And then you only have to grind little flat areas here where the roller actually sits. And um, so it makes for a very nice attachment. No interruptions on the on the roller surfaces. These were uh, lap. This is all hardened and ground uh, A2 tool steel, um, and and this is lapped on the um, for the final alignment of this relative to the rollers. So this is a I think four and a half inch sign bar was what worked out for the shape of the machine. And you'll see in the pictures how this was implemented. Here's a sign bar in place on the work head of this Landis uh, 1R grinder. Uh, it's against the reference rail that's uh, permanently mounted to the work head. Uh, the two pins that are in the holes in the sign bar have spring-loaded detents that uh, enable you to put some spring pressure against the bar or the gauge blocks. And the indicator is where it would normally be sitting as you tram in by moving the, the grinder table to set your angles or set the work head straight. Here's an example of using a uh, differential between two stacks of gauge blocks for doing very small angles. So there's no step on here, you know, 0.2 step like would be on a uh, sign plate. You just use the difference between two stacks of gauge blocks for the small angles. The plate is held on, the, the uh, black oxide plate is held on with the two thumb screws and can be removed. This is shown in the normal position where the head swings. Uh, counterclockwise looking from the top to grind tapers um, and the next we'll see the, the opposite direction. 
Here it is shown in the opposite uh, orientation for angles the opposite direction. One thing I forgot to mention is that on those spring-loaded uh, detent pins that are in the center of the uh, sign bar rollers, uh, on the underside is a thumb screw that is how those are uh, held in place.